Gentlemen, and welcome to the Institute of World Politics. We're very glad you could uh, join us this uh, lovely spring, early spring afternoon. It's been a pleasure to speak inside. Uh, in cases, this is your first time here at IWP. We're a graduate school of national security and international affairs. Uh, we have master's degree students as well as uh, students pursuing graduate certificates and people pursuing individual courses as well. We're very interested in teaching all the instruments of national security and how they can be integrated into a strategic and coherent fashion. We're very fortunate to have Dr. George Little with us this afternoon, uh, speaking of national security in the 24-hour news cycle. Uh, Dr. Little uh, holds a PhD in international relations from Georgetown University, and actually we're just talking about the fact that he is uh, an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown and serves on the board of advisors for their uh, Master of Science in Foreign Service program at the Walsh School of Foreign Service. Uh, he, currently, he's a partner at the Brunswick Group, an international crisis communications public relations firm with, I believe you said, 23 offices in 14 countries around the world. Um, formerly, he was uh, assistant to the United States Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs and the Pentagon Press Secretary. Uh, before that, he was the Director of Public Affairs and Chief of Media Relations at CIA. Do I have that right in the right order? I think so, yes. DOD and then CIA. Yeah, and uh, most recently, he was the Head of Marketing and Communications for Blue Island. Uh, looking forward to the event. Without further ado, Dr. Blue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all very much. I uh, appreciate your kind introduction. Be here uh, at the Institute, uh, which I know is uh, serving students well and really adding to the body of knowledge uh, here in Washington. I did see some uh, police activity outside. Uh, I was a little concerned that, that was on my account, but I'm glad that uh, <laughs> I haven't been arrested or anything like that. Uh, someone mentioned that I uh, went to Georgetown. That's true. I also went to the University of Virginia for my undergrad and, and master's degrees. It was a really tough weekend in the Final Four, so uh, I'm getting over my depression. Uh, but so bear with me if I if I wander. Uh, I'm delighted to talk today about uh, communicating uh, on national security in the uh, 21st century and uh, at a certain point uh, I really look forward to uh, engaging uh, in a conversation with you making this as informal as possible and uh, entertaining your uh, Q&A. I could take this uh, topic uh, in many directions but I thought I'd uh, chunk it into uh, three main topics. One is uh, looking at the communications environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, in uh, the mid-20-teens. Then uh, look at the role of a government spokesperson when it comes to national security. And then three, maybe uh, take a walk down memory lane uh, for me and go through a case study or two focused uh, primarily on the operation that resulted in the uh, apprehension and death of Osama bin Laden. Just a little bit about me, uh, not that this is really about me, but uh, I uh, thought I'd go through a little bit of my own um, career, and then we can open it up to uh, the substance I just described. I uh, did my PhD uh, and uh, thought I was going to uh, end up uh, on a nice lovely college campus somewhere. I ended up going to work for uh, IBM and doing management consulting uh, for a long time and then went to Booz Allen for a short stint uh, in the corporate sector and then uh, the national security community called and I was a uh, consultant at the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, which had opened a few years after 9-11 to try to solve some of the issues that were identified uh, in the intelligence community uh, that uh, some say uh, created uh, you know, the opportunity for terrorists to, to conduct the attack. In any event, uh, I was there at NCTC and uh, CIA called me up and said, George, we want you to be our spokesman. Uh, and I said, really? I've never done media relations or communications in my life. You must be crazy. Uh, and uh, you know, they said, really? We want you to come uh, be our spokesman. And I went home that night and uh, I said, Bethany, my wife, uh, you'll never believe what just happened to me. Uh, the CIA wants me to come be their spokesman. And she said, they're nuts. Uh, <laughs> do they know how candid you can be? Uh, and in any event, I thought I'd probably be fired after three or four weeks. Uh, I went there and uh, I uh, found it to be a deeply substantive uh, role. And uh, I was there toward the tail end of the Bush administration. Uh, with uh, Director Mike Hayden and then uh, Leon Panetta came on board. I was fortunate to serve with him uh, at the CIA and then uh, when he became uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, he said, George, you're coming with me to the Pentagon. I really didn't have a choice. Uh, so I went from Langley uh, down the river uh, to uh, the Pentagon where I was for two and a half years and was fortunate to serve uh, Secretary Hagel for the first uh, six or seven months of his tenure as Secretary of Defense. So this was a totally new uh, world for me. Uh, I have been in academia, uh, but I had to really learn the communications trade, uh, certainly media relations. I hadn't talked to anybody uh, in the media except at my college newspaper. Uh, actually, the editor-in-chief of my college newspaper is now one of my colleagues at the Brunswick Group. <laughs> uh, we reconnected uh, after a very long time. 
and uh, it's, uh, it's been a fun journey. Let me go through uh, the uh, communications environment uh, as I see it today. Uh, this gentleman and I were talking a little bit earlier, and he started his career uh, many decades ago, distinguished service uh, in USI USIA, uh, then part of the, the Foreign Service, so we talked about his tours in Vietnam and elsewhere. And there was a time when uh, we really, in this country, from a national security standpoint, viewed everything through the prism of the Cold War. Uh, I grew up worried about the Cold War, and that was really the organizing principle for all communications. And I would say in the post-9-11 era, the organizing principle for communications and national security issues was Al-Qaeda, at least for a short period of time. And now we face, our, I think, a situation in which uh, the national security community in the United States faces an unprecedented number of very serious threats. <laughs> and that is a very uh, big distinction, I think, between uh, what we see today and what we saw perhaps uh, when this gentleman started his career. At least that's my observation. Let me just rattle off some of what I know you all know are some of the threats out there today. We, of course, have CT issues. Al-Qaeda is still operating in various parts of the world. ISIS, of course, uh, gets a lot of attention these days. Uh, Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, China uh, is posing certain challenges. Uh, we have the cyber threat uh, as well, which is new and uh, I would say uh, underappreciated as a serious threat uh, and challenge. It's very hard to uh, discuss cybersecurity. It's not particularly tangible, uh, but it does pose a grave danger to us and, and to our allies. And then, of course, you have uh, North Korea and Iran and uh, other rogue states that we're still contending with. Uh, that's a much different landscape <laughs> than uh, when I started at NCTC uh, 10 years ago. That is qualitatively and quantitatively different. And uh, when you're a spokesperson or a policymaker or, or any high official in government, it's very difficult, I think, to, to grasp the enormity of all those challenges at once, unpack them, make sense of them, act on them, make decisions, and, and move out. It, it's just a tough landscape. This president has been handed a series of national security threats that uh, I think are very, very challenging. Uh, and I just listed, I think, probably uh, a few of them. <laughs> Another uh, part of the uh, landscape these days is Washington politics. And I don't think it's any great secret that we are experiencing great dysfunction uh, in this town. And uh, the old adage that uh, when it comes to national security politics stops at the water's edge is now no longer relevant, I'm afraid. Uh, now we see the politics of what I'll call Benghazi, BB, and the bomb. Um, it's uh, become a politically charged uh, atmosphere, whether it's uh, the Benghazi attack, which of course was a great tragedy, or uh, the process by which uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was invited uh, to uh, speak before Congress, and uh, all the politics surrounding uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, negotiations uh, as we speak. This, uh, in and of itself, uh, presents a national security challenge, uh, in my view, the dysfunction of Washington. And we should not lose sight of that at this point. That problem has manifested itself, I think, in various ways, uh, but uh, certainly uh, we've seen it through the budgetary process, which doesn't sound particularly scintillating, <laughs> but uh, it really does uh, create a problem when we impose mechanisms like sequestration. I was uh, with uh, Secretary Panetta you know, just shortly after he became Secretary of Defense. We went out to lunch with a couple other aides uh, in Arlington, and uh, he said, George, uh, at that time sequestration hadn't actually been imposed. George, what should my public stance be uh, if uh, sequestration goes into effect? And what should I say about it now in advance? And I said, well, sir, one out of every 100 Americans works for you. <laughs> 2.2 million uh, active duty guard and reserve, uh, 800,000 uh, civilians uh, in the Department of Defense, that's roughly 3 million, plus 4 million people in the defense industrial base who might have their jobs affected. I said, I don't think you have any choice <laughs> but to say something about sequestration. Uh, and if you fight and you win, great. You fight and you get the credit for winning. If you fight and you lose, at least you're fought. And that's exactly what he did. He became very loud on the issue of sequestration. I think he was already there. I don't think he needed my <laughs> prompting. But uh, again, you gotta be, uh, you gotta be direct uh, when it comes to the politics of, of Washington these days. Uh, the lack of civility in relationships is also a, a contributing problem. Uh, and uh, I gotta tell you, I think that uh, it's a real issue when compromise in this town is seen as weakness, uh, especially on national security. 
Compromise is not something that gets rewarded on Capitol Hill or in the political system these days. Often people who, elected officials who engage in compromise are punished uh, at the polls uh, in the next election cycle. And I think that's a real issue. Politics used, to, uh, making a deal or compromise used to be good politics. Uh, it isn't uh, anymore. So, so some of these factors are, I think, very serious. Um, and uh, I think we need to, to work through that. I used to sit in meetings with foreign officials uh, and you could tell that they were hedging a little bit because they weren't sure about American commitments, whether it was a budget commitment or some other kind of commitment because they weren't sure if our own politics were gonna allow for it. And then there's the media, all right? Don't let me forget the media. Uh, I was a spokesperson for nearly seven years. Uh, loved every minute of it, uh, if you believe that, no. <laughs> uh, but you know, the media is really uh, a tough business these days. Um, I mean, when it comes to national security, think about it. When you look at national security coverage and the major newspapers, just to call them out for a second, how many major newspapers right now cover national security issues in a systematic, persistent, in-depth way? New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Any others? LA Times. LA Times. Less and less. Less and less. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, when I was growing up uh, here in Washington or nearby, uh, across the river, you had the Baltimore Sun, you had the Chicago Sun Times, uh, you had the San Francisco Chronicle, you had various newspaper outlets that covered national security issues in a systematic way. And now you really have very few. So that's one changing dynamic. You have downsizing and consolidation and lack of focus uh, by many media outlets on national security issues. That's not to say that other newspapers don't have national security reporters. USA Today, LA Times, others, but they don't necessarily cover the beat like uh, reporters do for those major papers that we talked about before. And then of course, you have uh, social media and the democratization. Of, uh, of reporting. Now, this has created a scattered landscape, of course, uh, and citizen journalists and so forth. I think by and large, uh, in my view, this has created a new pace <laughs> uh, for national uh, security uh, officials like me who are in the public affairs world. Uh, over my seven years, it became increasingly rapid uh, dealing with issues. Uh, but I think this is generally a, a positive thing. Um, it does create challenges, don't, don't get me wrong. But uh, I think that the rise of social media is generally a, a, a good thing. So that's uh, the communications environment. Let me uh, switch now to the role of uh, government spokesperson in national security. Is this hitting the mark for people? Okay, all right, nod your heads, okay. <laughs> if not, uh, let me know. The, um, the job of a national security spokesperson uh, is not to play politics. I have been a political appointee uh, in the Obama administration, uh, but my job at the Pentagon and at CIA was not to be political. Remember that three million people I, ta I talked about earlier? You cannot be political uh, and represent that many people, one out of every 100 Americans. Uh, that's not what uh, you should be doing as a Pentagon spokesman and of course in the intelligence community that's uh, looked down upon as well. You of course are responsible for defending the administration's policies, for articulating those national security policies, uh, in defending the institutions uh, you work in uh, and your bosses. Uh, but it's not to spin like uh, a political press operative would uh, on a campaign. This may sound a little contradictory, uh, but I think that the most important role that a government spokesperson can play is to be an active listener. Now, that may seem counterintuitive, but here's what I mean by that. I think it's to Listen to your boss and what his or her uh, priorities are, uh, his or her approach to the press, and so forth. It's to listen to your colleagues and to be very aware of your environment. I paid very close attention to that both at CIA and DOD because reporters don't like to just play the, the, the substance game in reporting. They also care about the internal workings of the organization and especially at CIA for some reason there's been a decades long obsession with CIA morale. <laughs> and uh, a lot of reporters like to, well, CIA morale is up or down. I don't quite know how you measure that. <laughs> but as director of public affairs there, I certainly uh, felt like I was at least in part a custodian uh, of agency morale. You obviously want to listen closely to reporters. 
because they sometimes know more about what's happening inside your agency on certain issues than you do at a given moment. And they also, I think, have a general sense of where the institution is heading or a particular policy. So you've got to be an active listener. You also need to have access, of course, when you're at a certain level, to your boss. If you don't have access to what your boss is thinking, then reporters are generally not going to uh, view your information as being as, uh, particularly, uh, well, they might view it as credible, but they may not respect uh, your role as much as, as they should. So I, I really fought for, for access and was fortunate to work for senior officials who gave me access. There's a tendency in Washington to draw these bright lines between the press and government spokespeople and, and, and other government officials. I gotta tell you, it is really important, even in national security, to engage with reporters. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a cocktail reception in DC, because that's what we do here in DC. We go to cocktail receptions all the time, right? And, uh, well, what do you do? Which is the standard DC question, right? And uh, I said, well, I'm the CIA spokesman. Uh, no, tell me, really, what do you do? <laughs> and, no, uh, really, I'm the CIA spokesman. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> no, really, finally, I convinced them. Uh, I even had a business card. <laughs> Sometimes I took that. Uh, and George Little is my real name. <laughs> Uh, not some pseudo or alias. Um, and then, oh, well, that mu then the response would be, well, that must be one of the easiest jobs in town. Because uh, all you do is say no comment. <laughs> Which actually is untrue these days uh, for, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, the reporters who cover the intelligence community broadly, but certainly the CIA, are very seasoned. Uh, and they're a very intelligent group of reporters. And your job is not necessarily to just issue quotes and so forth, but it's to help provide context not to dole out classified information, but to provide context around certain issues and to help separate the wheat from the chaff that they're hearing. Because they get a lot of emails and phone calls from all kinds of sources. Some of the information is right and some of it is wrong. And it's important that you help suss out what makes sense and, and what doesn't. So investing in those press relationships, I think, is absolutely vital. And it doesn't have to be uh, press briefings and so forth. It can be informal coffees. It can be... Uh, lunches, it can be backgrounders uh, that you offer up uh, with agency uh, analysts. Uh, it can be any number of, of ways to engage. Reporters are about getting education to some extent, right? Uh, they want to learn more, and that's what fascinates them <laughs> about their field, uh, and they need to be informed. Uh, and then if you invest in those relationships when crisis hits, and I've seen crisis hit on multiple occasions, uh, then you probably get a fair shake uh, from reporters, to be honest with you, because they know that you are credible, that you've invested in them, and that it's the support of a long season. And I, I think that just uh, that stands to reason. But you do so see some agencies out there in government that uh, are less than uh, forthcoming uh, with reporters. They don't invest in those relationships, and I think it's to their to their detriment. Um, You know, we have a tendency in this town to get into jargon. <laughs> Don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> but, you know, in the intelligence community, it's, there's a lot of intelligence speak. You know, in the defense world, there are all kinds of acronyms. <laughs> I could probably deliver this entire lecture <laughs> uh, in acronyms, uh, even only after two and a half years at uh, the Pentagon. But the American people, at the end of the day, are very smart, and I think want straight talk. And when they feel like they're getting the bureaucratic mumbo jumbo, that doesn't help. And I've quite frankly uh, been guilty of it uh, myself. I, I know when it's happening, you know, but we're, the way we're, we've been asked to articulate a, a certain policy, that's just the way you have to go. But sometimes you just need to deliver the news uh, straight up. This is what I admired about my, my bosses in government. They were pretty straight talking people. Uh, and I tried to reflect that uh, as much as I could. It's important to be uh, authentic. I'll, I'll never forget uh, one of the uh, toughest calls I got uh, from the White House after a press briefing at the Pentagon was uh, when the Iranians were making noises about uh, and threatening to close the Straits of Hormuz, which as you know is a major shipping lane for oil and other, other goods. And uh, I said, well, what would you all do if they closed the Strait of Hormuz? And I said, well, we won't tolerate the <laughs> closing of the Strait of Hormuz, which was fairly direct, clear signal to the Iranians that they probably shouldn't uh, mess around with us. And uh, I got a call from a senior official at the White House and they were concerned that I'd gone a little strong uh, against Iran. It's our long-standing policy. I thought it was straight talk, and by the end of the day, the White House was adopting my line. So, felt uh, felt pretty good about that. Um, 
another lesson learned, uh, in addition to straight talk, this goes back to social media too, is treat every query like it's serious. Some spokespeople have a tendency to think of the mainstream media or the elite outlets as somehow more important than blogs. I gotta tell you, in this day and age, you treat every outlet the same when it comes to queries. You respond quickly, you try to figure out what the answer is, and get it out there. Because mainstream reporters, if I can call them that, uh, look to the blogs these days. Sometimes they are tip sheets. Sometimes the blogs in and of themselves break stories. So there's really a blurring of the lines, I think, between traditional media outlets and new media outlets that um, people need to, to take into account. There was a moment, again, uh, Secretary Panetta, actually was then Director Panetta at CIA, was about four or five months into his tenure, and we were having a little issue um, over um, documents related to the uh, detention interrogation program uh, that the CIA had run from 2002 to 2009. And uh, this caused some tension uh, with the Department of Justice, and there was a rumor floating around that uh, Director Panetta was about to resign, and this appeared on a right-leaning uh, social media site, and my phones just started going nuts. And at that very moment, by coincidence, uh, I got a call from the director's office, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> maybe this is true. <laughs> And he just wanted to have lunch. <laughs> so we went down to the CIA cafeteria where there was a food court, a very good one, uh, and uh, probably the highest gross revenue generating uh, Starbucks in, in, the, in the world. Uh, and uh, we, we sat down and, and, uh, and had lunch. And I, I said, this is a bit awkward for me to take lunch off with, sir, but uh, there's a certain site out there that's reporting that you're about to hand in your resignation. And uh, you know, awkward moment for me, I'd only known him a few months, and are you resigning, sir, is not the way you want to necessarily uh, start a lunch or, or your career uh, with uh, someone who's as esteemed as, as Leon Panetta. I, I can't really repeat for a family audience uh, his reaction, uh, but needless to say, it was, uh, it was wrong, uh, but uh, it had gone viral, and that's just the way the world is right now. Some of these rumors uh, go viral, and you have to stamp them out as, as quickly as possible. But treat every query um, like it matters. Leaks. Let me get on to leaks. Um, I am not naive enough to believe that leaks are a new thing. <laughs> I think that uh, leaks have been around since the dawn of our republic. Um, there's no question about that. But I do think that uh, in the national security arena there has been a breakdown in discipline. Uh, in various agencies and departments, and I think that's very, very unhelpful. We can point to the extreme cases of Snowden or WikiLeaks or, or what have you, but there are perhaps lesser but still very damaging instances of, of leaks as well. And I can't really understand why that discipline is, has broken down. Uh, I can't really explain it uh, fully, but I do think it's probably empirically provable, even though I'm not a scientist. I think we could probably uh, point to an increasing number of leaks. That may be an unintended consequence of the very good intention of more information sharing. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, and I, I'm not against information sharing. <laughs> Let me be clear for the record uh, for viewers watching at home. But I uh, do think that uh, we, we have seen just a torrent of, uh, of leaks that uh, I think is, is very damaging. I used to sit in uh, CIA operational meetings, or at DOD, classified missions, we would run through the operation, it's lawful, check, you know, it's approved, check, and it's consistent with American policy, <laughs> check. And then I would always say, well, are you guys ready for this to go public? And I would often get the response, well, this is a classified mission, and it'll never go public. And I said, well, it may not go public tomorrow, or when you conduct it, or next week, or next year, but ultimately this will come out. And are you ready for that? because uh, you have to really be prepared to protect your sources and your methods and so forth when it does come out. And by and large, I think I'm, I'm right. I mean, I would say 99% of the time, that does happen uh, at some point in time, because there are so many people now who have so much access to information that um, leaks are just a condition to be managed uh, at this point. This administration has obviously taken a hard stand uh, on unauthorized disclosures of classified information. Uh, which is the technical term for leaks. <laughs> uh, I think that's appropriate uh, in many cases. Um, it's just something to be, to be dealt with. Um, 
Let me uh, turn now, if I can, to uh, the Bin Laden raid, and then I'd like to get to your, to your questions. Um, I could talk about other case studies, too. Um, I think this is just one that's illustrative of some of the points that I reflected on earlier. So in addition to being an active listener, when you're a government spokesperson, I think that you need to think long-term and be strategic first. If you're not strategic, uh, then you're not doing your job. If you're simply responding to queries or waiting for others to feed you lines to share at the podium, that's not really, um, that's not doing your job. You're not fulfilling your, your responsibility. Uh, you owe it to be strategic. You owe it to your boss, whoever he or she is, to provide the best possible counsel on the policy and how it might play, and of course, on the communications. So I always thought of myself first as a strategic advisor and then a communicator second. Now, I don't know if that works for everyone, uh, but that's how I construed of the role, uh, both at CIA and, and DOD. And I think it's important to have that role uh, because then you can really help shape the organization's thinking about how to carry out certain decisions or policies uh, to deal with crises uh, when they emerge. And um, then you have, I think, more credibility uh, when you're out there speaking, <laughs> if you've been part of that process. If you're brought in at the last minute, which is a tendency in many organizations, oh, well, we've had this crisis emerge. We've known about it for three months. Uh, let's bring the communicators in, and tomorrow, <laughs> you know, we'll get them up to speed, and then they'll go out to the microphones. I would not have stayed in the job that long had that been the case. I just don't think you could be effective. And you're leaving important opportunity on the table if that's the way your organization operates. So to that end, uh, and this is just an illustrative case, uh, so I had known about the intelligence stream uh, leading uh, to, to Bin Laden you know, long before the actual raid, several months. Uh, the first bit of intelligence came in in August of 2010. We, of course, developed more and more information along the way. And at a certain point, once I realized that we were starting to think about military planning and options and so forth, I went into the director's office at CIA and I talked to the team there and I said, uh, I don't know if this has, uh, you know, kind of dawned on you guys, but if we conduct this raid, it's going to be big news. <laughs> this might make a few headlines. <laughs> oh, by the way, if this goes public, which it probably will, uh, we're talking here about the presidency and the CIA reputation and so forth. We have to have a plan. <laughs> we need to be somewhat strategic about it. Uh, so I was able to convince uh, the, uh, the team there to... Uh, allow me to, uh, with a very small group of people, develop a contingency public affairs plan. I had to call it a contingency public affairs plan uh, because the lawyers were concerned that if I was preparing such a plan for a covert operation, this might not exactly square with Title 50 of the U.S. Code. Uh, but I'm assured by legal counsel that all is well, mm -hmm. and I did not violate American law. Uh, but what was interesting about that was that I was brought in early, and this is, again, not about me, just about the principle that bringing communicators in is, is critical. So I would sit through the meetings the director had with the, the Bin Laden team. I would go to the daily operational meetings uh, that involved people from across uh, the intelligence community who were working the various bits of intelligence coming in. And that really helped me prepare what ultimately was a public affairs package that included the unclassified, what would be unclassified intelligence case. Um, and uh, presidential statement, diagrams uh, of the Abbottabad compound, and, and so forth and so on. Now, one of the things that we had to decide early on was, okay, well, we know what we're going to say when it comes to success. We got them. But we also have to plan for something that goes wrong. Uh, the operation goes bad somehow, or uh, it's not Bin Laden. <laughs> we didn't know, of course, it was Bin Laden until the, uh, the day of. Uh, it was all circumstantial until that very moment could be some fugitive <laughs> criminal that happens to be very tall <laughs> uh, or, uh, or, or some other person. So I decided, look, I can't envision every scenario that is, uh, is going to be deemed failure, so we'll just create a failure scenario and then fill in the gaps later. So I developed a public affairs package, 66 pages, 33 pages for success, 33 pages for failure, however defined. <laughs> And uh, I took it down to the White House, where the first White House communicator was, was read in a few days before the raid. 
we wor work through it. Uh, the next day, or, or the same day, Secretary Panetta was nominated to become Secretary of Defense, or Director Panetta was nominated to become Secretary of Defense. And I wasn't stressed out enough. <laughs> uh, we had the raid coming, my boss is getting nominated, <laughs> and um, we have all these meetings. <laughs> I got to prepare this package. I go back on Saturday morning uh, to the White House. For some reason, my name was not in the White House uh, Secret Service system uh, for entry uh, into the White House. I have to tell you, I'm generally pretty calm, cool, and collected, uh, but I, have to, I was sweating because in a classified lock bag, I had all the documents <laughs> relating to, to the Bin Laden raid, and I was really afraid I was going to get mugged <laughs> in Lafayette <laughs> Park, <laughs> and the whole thing would be blown. <laughs> but after 45 minutes or an hour, <laughs> uh, and after I came to, no, uh, that, that part's not real, I, uh, I was admitted. And, and uh, that night, of course, was the, uh, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and um, there were several people over the course of that Saturday who said, George, I'm just really tired of senior officials who were invited to this dinner. George, I really cannot go to this dinner. I've been working hard. And I said, I'll put it politely, you're going to go to, to the dinner tonight. <laughs> uh, make it at least through dessert, and then you can make an excuse and go. But do not let on. This is a group of reporters, after all, <laughs> that anything uh, interesting is up. Uh, and, and all those officials actually went for at least uh, part of the evening. And of course, there were a lot of Bin Laden jokes uh, that night. Everyone kept poker face, including the president, uh, to his credit. Um, it didn't really dawn on me that this mission was about to begin uh, until fully, I think, until Sunday, at exactly 1.22 p.m. on May 1st, 2011, when, just by happenstance, I was in Director Panetta's uh, conference room, which had been turned into the operations center uh, for the mission. And up on the screen was Admiral Mercraven, who conducted the military, uh, command of the military aspects of the mission. This was overall, uh, you know, a CIA mission, so Director Panetta had uh, overall uh, command and, and control authority, but uh, uh, obviously uh, Admiral Mercraven and our special operations uh, teams uh, conducted the, the, the actual raid. And um, they were chit-chatting a little bit uh, on screen. And then finally, uh, Director Potato said something along the lines of, okay now, Bill, uh, I'm conveying to you the order of the President of the United States to commence this operation. And I have one thing to say to you. Go in and get him, or get the hell out. Uh, and that was classic Panetta. Uh, straightforward, direct, sometimes some salty language thrown in there. And uh, that, for me, was uh, kind of an overwhelming moment. And then about a, an hour and a half later, uh, the raid, of course, occurred uh, on the compound. We weren't totally uh, relieved uh, until A, we knew it was Bin Laden, and, and B, our uh, special operations forces were out of Pakistani airspace. And I went to the White House that night. And this is part of the whole public relations thing internationally, too. It's not just about the press and how you're going to roll it out there, but it's also about those conversations with Congress and with your allies and partners, and sometimes not your allies and partners. <laughs> uh, and there was a whole plan that evening for notifying Congress, and I thought to myself, okay, if you notify Congress, this is probably going to <laughs> make its way to the public fairly soon. Uh, and of course, there was an entire plan uh, and notification schedule uh, for uh, our allies and partners. The first call was actually made, appropriately so, to the Pakistanis. Um, the president wasn't actually going to uh, go out that evening, uh, but several of us convinced White House advisors that it might be a good thing to go ahead and get this out because it when information like this starts to spread around to allies in, in the Congress. <coughs> it is Bin Laden after all, it's going to be a big story. So he eventually, of course, did go uh, to make a speech that evening. We, uh, we left that night uh, at around 12.30. I was with uh, Panetta and uh, one other aide. And this was not for us, but it was a crowd assembled in front of the White House. And uh, at that very moment, they couldn't see us because of construction but they were chanting CIA, 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 uh, and I turned to Director Panetta and I said, I don't know whether to smile or run, sir. <laughs> Usually large crowds chanting CIA is not a good thing. Uh, in any event, uh, all's well that ends well. But the bottom line from a, an overall uh, lessons learned standpoint is that putting together a little bit of strategy and, and planning uh, for communicating uh, the raid, I think was was very helpful. Not everything went right, and I knew it when it was a feeding frenzy. And a lot of people who didn't know very much about the raid started talking uh, pretty soon uh, thereafter, giving all kinds of details out, some of which were true, some of which were were wrong. Uh, 
but uh, had we not done that upfront work, uh, I think uh, it uh, would have gone much more haywire. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it was good that, that uh, communicators uh, like, like me were brought in and not brought in at the last minute. Oh, by the way, we just got Bin Laden. Oh, okay, uh, have at it. I mean, that's just not the way any organization, frankly, uh, in, in government or the private sector should operate uh, in this day and age. Um, why don't I stop there? Uh, and uh, those are just some opening thoughts uh, about the uh, communications landscape, uh, the role of government spokesperson, and uh, just some, some thoughts using one. Uh, case study, but I'd love to talk about any other things that are on your mind. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, thanks for extending us the courtesy of your time. I also went to Georgetown back in 2004. Hoya so Saxa, all right, good. <laughs> uh, given the increased impact that soft power has in the from approximate extra state and state security concerns, I wonder what your thoughts are on the role of the interaction between the media, internal political distance, let's like, say, in this case, non interventionists on the both the left and the right. Adversary strategic information influence operation, I'm thinking of the Russian SBR as it was outlined mm -hmm. by Alexander Dugan's plan, has on national will surrounding United States interventionist foreign policies crucial to United States national security interests, and also how leaks play into an adversary's gray and dark gray propaganda efforts regarding those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me try to uh, boil it down there. <laughs> very, very, very good question, and if I go astray, please uh, keep me on the straight and narrow. Uh, look, uh, there are a lot of uh, countries out there that conduct very sophisticated information operations and, and propaganda. Uh, we've been continuing that with that for a very long time, uh, and I'm sure you could name several of them. <laughs> and it does create challenges, I think, uh, for our intelligence community to suss out what's real and what isn't sometimes, and of course uh, for policymakers who are trying to decide what's real, what's not, how do we react uh, to, to this information that may or not be r real. Uh, we see terrorist groups, not just state actors, but non-state actors, uh, and not just terrorist groups, but other non-state actors engage in this kind of uh, activity too. And uh, it's very, very tough because uh, once information is out there, it's tough to put it back uh, in the box. Look, information operations have been a way of life uh, for a long time and they will continue to be. I think it's just gonna be more complex uh, because the volume, uh, given all the technology we have out there, uh, is going to increase. What was your question on, on leaks? Well, the role that sorry. leaks play on an adversary's dark, or gray, or dark gray propaganda efforts. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, yeah, Sergei yeah. Sergei Petrikov outlined how mm -hmm. the evolution of, from Soviet to contemporary yeah. Russian, right? I mean, it's not so ham-fisted anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. like, put forward 98% yeah. of an accurate document. Yeah, yeah, Le leaks are uh, hugely um, damaging in many cases, um, and not just Snowden. That's a whole other category of, of damage, in my opinion. Uh, but they can really help uh, the enemy uh, or the adversary, uh, however defined. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, and it's not just leaks anymore that uh, are creating problems. Uh, other countries and, and non-state actors are also getting into our systems. They're finding new ways uh, to learn our, our plans uh, and intentions as a government, but also in the private sector. And so I think we're just going to have to continue to, to manage it uh, on the cyber front uh, in particular. I don't think where we, we, we're where we need to be. Um, this town really hasn't figured it out. Um, this whole world, uh, actually the president called it the Wild Wild West <laughs> uh, at the Silicon Valley Summit uh, a few weeks ago. And you know, the new normal is everyone's getting hacked <laughs> in government uh, and in the private sector. And I don't know that we fully appreciate uh, the damage uh, that that new normal is going to cause. Um, data, you know, it affects reputation uh, of different organizations. Um, data destruction is a real problem that's happened in some cases. It can be existential for some organizations, not necessarily in the government, uh, but certainly in the private sector. And again, this story is hard to tell. I don't know, you know too many reporters out there that are covering cyber on a regular basis. Uh, and in Europe, uh, which has experienced a lot of cyber um, problems, there aren't that many media on the beat at all. There might be one or two reporters who dip in and out of cyber coverage. Uh, but if you're interested in going in, into journalism and can give us an editor uh, in Europe, uh, you can probably make a name for yourself because there's very little coverage, except on the privacy side of the equation. But on the cybersecurity side, states and non-state actors getting in, psh, very few media covering it. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. Yeah. Other uh, questions? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ryan Kelly, I'm an intern here. Um, so to follow up with that, what 
do you think it's going to take for writers in the media to get involved with covering cyber terrorism or cyber attacks? Is it going to take a large scale attack for people to wake up and say, wow, this some, some of the smart outlets are, are starting to wake up to this beat, but I, I do worry that uh, some media outlets and society at large won't uh, fully appreciate this problem until there is a crisis of a certain magnitude. And it's not just a clean cyber crisis in some cases. I'm worried about the nexus between cyber and physical damage too, to people uh, and to property. Uh, because if you look at what's happening now with what they call the Internet of Things, <laughs> everything is basically a computer, right? You drive a car, it's a moving computer. You, you fly in an airplane, <laughs> it's a flying uh, computer. Trains are moving computers. And I worry that um, if the wrong people uh, do the wrong things to certain computer systems that we're going to see a nexus between cybersecurity and terrorism, for instance. Thank yes, sir. Yeah. It's a good question. Uh, I wasn't uh, in government uh, when that decision was made, but let me speculate here. You're not supposed to speculate at the podium, but I will. <laughs> uh, I think at this administration there probably were communicators uh, at the table uh, weighing in on how to handle this uh, from not just a North Korean perspective, how do we deal with, with North Korea and, and push back, but also how do we contextualize this uh, for the American public and uh, you know, identify the broader problems associated with these kinds of cyber attacks. So I, prob I believe that uh, in, in all likelihood, uh, officials uh, in my world uh, at the White House and in the intelligence community and, and State Department were probably involved uh, in that decision. That's pure uh, speculation uh, on my part. But uh, yeah, that's the, the, the Sony attack is very interesting because in some ways it seems a little bit uh, unusual, um, outside the norm, et cetera. I actually think we're going to see more and more attacks like this. Not that we're going to see a lot of movie houses make films about Kim Jong-un. Mm -hmm. uh, but the kind of reputational attacks like this, going after internal emails, and what we saw in Sony was pretty bad, right? There were all kinds of offensive emails involving, well, the president, <laughs> uh, racial issues, uh, gender pay inequality, that kind of thing. It was straight to the heart of, of reputation. So it's not all about credit card breaches anymore. <laughs> uh, it's about the reputational uh, effects of cyber breaches that I think uh, can be very problematic, and not just for Hollywood, uh, but for all kinds of uh, organizations uh, in the public and private sectors. Sir. Sir, I'm Brian Platt. I'm in the uh, Army. And Who I? Uh, <laughs> graduated here in 2012. And I, I work in the somewhat communications realm. Not, I'm not a public affairs officer by any means. Mm -hmm. uh, but why, why did you uh, issue that caveat? <laughs> <laughs> it's different. There's a lot of, I, I a lot of friction. Never there. apologize for that, though. No. <laughs> um, and my question goes back to uh, sequestration. Mm -hmm. I might be getting too much in the weeds, but it's okay. I want to get an answer based on your experience working in the Pentagon. And this past week or so, um, senior le army leaders have been up on the hill mm -hmm. talking about sequestration and the damage it could do and the risk to the national security of, of, of continuing with the sequestration. And it seems to be falling flat mm -hmm. in the ears of Congress. So my question is, is the Army missing something in, in, as far as making their argument more compelling? Is it just mm -hmm. Congress doesn't understand or doesn't care? It's a very good question, uh, and I've been puzzled by it uh, myself to some extent. I do think that the Army is right, uh, by and large. I mean, we can disagree on minor points, but by and large, the Army's right, the Air Force is right, the Navy's right, and the Marine Corps is right. What we're going to see from sequestration, if it is lasting, is uh, an erosion of military readiness. You know, it's, it's, that's, at the end of the day, what we're going to see. We're going to see a, a smaller Army that's less ready to confront the various threats that I outlined at the top of this discussion. So I think it is a, a real problem, and uh, that's my personal take. Why the message hasn't gotten through, um, and I guess I have to blame myself in part because uh, we still face the specter of sequestration, and, and even though I 
called it a meat axe to a chain, attached to a chainsaw. I mean, they use all kinds of crazy <laughs> uh, analogies with the press. Uh, we still fa face these budget issues. Sequestration, first of all, and, and budgets feel very inside baseball to many people uh, in this country. So that's one challenge to <coughs> uh, identify up front. I think that um, we see the old coalitions on, on Capitol Hill changing uh, 10 years ago. Uh, if you'd said, well, we're going to see you know, the right of the political spectrum and the left of the political spectrum come together <laughs> and agree that we really need to uh, cut defense spending deeply, uh, I think someone would have accused you of, of smoking something radical. So the, the political coalitions have really changed. Uh, and you know, it's not just, it's, it's Repu you have Republicans who are non-hawks <laughs> and who want to cut defense. <laughs> And now you have, uh, you know, and you have other Republicans who are hawks and, and would like to keep defense spending where it is or even increase it. And of course you have folks on the Democratic side who uh, also believe that uh, defense spending should be. So you have this coalition uh, of uh, unlikely partners uh, that are affecting the political debate. I also think that, um, this is just my personal conjecture here, that, um, well, there's a little national security fatigue uh, in the country. And when it comes to military spending, I think this is an issue that we need to confront more broadly, and that is that uh, you know, we, we have fewer than 1% of Americans who serve. So you know, even in wartime, where we spent most of the last uh, 15 years, this feels very distant. And many Americans don't know anyone uh, who served in the military, uh, don't understand the price of service, and would rather us just not be involved overseas. Now, that may be the right decision to make in certain cases, uh, but that distance uh, between the 99% and the less than 1%, I think, also creates an issue uh, in, in that people aren't really seized of the matter. Um, and aren't, there's not that, that push to keep defense spending where it is. Inside the defense budget, which is about half of uh, discretionary spending in the federal budget, it's around $500 billion, depending on, on how you count it, a lot of it's not spent on hardware and planes and tanks and new programs. A lot of it's spent on health of the force. I think 50 to 60 billion is spent on health care. That number, of course, will continue to rise. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's just a, a lot of stuff you know, inside that budget that uh, isn't necessarily at what I would call the tip of the spear, but it's still very important. Uh, and I don't quite know how we unlock ourselves uh, out of this, but uh, it's just perhaps going to take a crisis. Uh, but bottom line is I think the Army's right. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs has been right when he says that uh, this is um, a national security problem, and uh, we'll just see where it takes us. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. right. And for you as a spokesperson, I just wanted your reaction. And also, when I tried to do both sides, um, the, the whistleblower, John, I should say his name, Kiriakos, Kiriak, Kiriak, there's a double standard um, with the Petraeus in that one, and I just wanted your comment. Um, so, on, on the, the specific cyber incident that, that you mentioned? So uh, Senator Markey uh, on the Hill has been very vocal about his concerns about the cybersecurity of automobiles. Uh, and he's been, I think, appropriately uh, voicing uh, concern over, over these issues. So yes, to the earlier point, whether it comes to cars or planes or, or, or trains or other forms of transportation, I do think we have to be mindful of cybersecurity issues when it comes to transportation and our transportation infrastructure. Uh, so you know, I, that, that's, that's where I am on, on that. Uh, on uh, the matter involving uh, Director uh, Petraeus, I don't really 
know that I'm competent to uh, speak to the specifics simply because I don't know the nature of the information that Director Petraeus appears to have uh, shared. Uh, and so I don't know that I can draw uh, any comparisons between those two uh, cases. I know it's an issue of debate, but I'm not sure I'm competent to address it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. And I have two questions for you. Yes. One, I thought you described quite, quite nicely the, uh, the move toward more and more leaks into mm -hmm. the national security realm and the Obama administration's pretty hardline uh, approach to containing them. Mm -hmm. And you, you speculated that you, you said you didn't know what the cause might be, but it could be due to some increased information sharing. That's one interesting mm -hmm. hypothesis. Another might be that the the absence of whistleblower protection in the national security realm might have something to do with the prevalence of leaks, since they were explicitly excluded from the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, which would be to say that some people leaking it, they think they've seen misconduct of some sort or some kind of inconsistency, or require mm -hmm. you have no, no alternative but to leak to reporter because retaliation is likely to follow. So that's one question. Do you think the lack of whistleblower protection for national security whistleblowers has anything to do with that? And the second is, I wonder if you could comment on, uh, I thought uh, it was striking after the uh, Obama, uh, the, the Bin Laden raid, to see the President of the United States taking full responsibility for a covert operation in another country. I can't think of another example where, where that would apply. Uh, so I want to know a little bit more about this contingency public affairs plan that you devised and what was part of that. If you could say more about Sure, that. sure. Um, yeah, I'm ha happy to. Yeah. Yeah, on, on, the, on the first point, uh, this whole whistleblower debate on, on the intelligence uh, community, there are channels. I was an intelligence officer for, for a number of years, and I knew that I could go to my manager, to the inspector general, which is uh, an independent uh, body inside uh, the intelligence community, or at least quasi-independent. I could go to the House or Senate Intelligence Committee if I thought there was wrongdoing. And so there are actually protections uh, and legally available avenues for intelligence officers to express concern about intelligence programs or other alleged you know, instances of malfeasance, however defined. Um, so I think there are protections. They may not be well known, so maybe they need, they need to be advertised more uh, inside the intelligence community. But uh, your first act should not be to go from concern to the media. And I think that's where some people have gone. The vast majority of, <laughs> overwhelming majority of uh, national security professionals in the defense and intelligence communities are, are law abiding and they follow the rules and so forth, but it only takes a few bad apples to make a real problem, uh, as we saw in the case of Snowden. So I do think there are protections uh, and there are whistleblowing avenues. Uh, I'm not an expert on whistleblowing laws, uh, but uh, I think there are whistleblowing avenues. And the second question, remind me, Oh, yes, the Bin Laden. Yes. Why did the president speak about a covert operation? Well, it just, I can't think of another example where I've, I've seen that before. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think of another example uh, myself. Um, well, in this case, it's Osama Bin Laden. Yeah. We've gone into another country, a country that's a partner without their knowledge, using special, U.S. Special Operations Forces. And this was, don't forget, a raid conducted in the Pakistani equivalent of West Point. So this is not a remote region of the tribal areas of Pakistan. This is a densely populated area of that country. So we knew it would be observable <laughs> by someone. Uh, and in fact, I think it's come out in press reports that uh, there were tweets about it and other social media commentary and so forth. So there was really no choice at the end of the day but to own this. And of course the president can make a decision whether or not to divulge Title 50 uh, information. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it's necessarily unusual. I mean, we, uh, for instance, uh, in the intelligence community in September of 2009, it wasn't the president, actually it was the president, uh, who spoke, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, at least uh, at some point, to uh, the discovery of a covert uh, nuclear uh, facility um, in Iran, uh, near Qom. Uh, and so, you know, that obviously involves some very 
specialized intelligence. And uh, so I, I do think there is, there is precedent uh, for it. Um, Bay of Pigs, <laughs> a long time ago, Title 50 <laughs> operation, or different, different, different day and age. It doesn't happen that often. But in this case, I don't think that anybody had a choice uh, but to recommend to the president uh, to go out with this information. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Ed Fox. I'm a former government official. Okay, great. Um, you spoke about the importance of trying to make sure the communicators are in on the takeoff so they can be in on the landing, mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Yeah. We've seen a number of instances by this administration over the last couple of years where the communicators themselves have become the story, mm -hmm. whether that was in Benghazi or whether that was in Syria, ISIL, ISIS, um, causes of terrorism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. State Department people, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I've always uh, been taught that uh, if you become part of the story, you have failed, number mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Uh, are there lessons there that uh, you see uh, that you might comment on, the uh, do's and don'ts, and uh, uh, anything else in that area? Absolutely, and, and you're right. Uh, in virtually every administration I, I can think of, uh, at various points, some spokespeople have become the story, and that's absolutely what you do not want. <laughs> and it's cost some, some spokespeople their jobs uh, over time, uh, and it certainly has, has hit their reputation. Uh, I think you have to be, I mean, it's all about judgment <laughs> at the end of the day. It's all about being careful. I can't uh, impress enough the importance of prepared preparedness. Uh, and wh where I've seen spokespeople go off the rails, it's when they've gone into an interview, whether it's an exclusive on CNN or to the podium, they're just not prepared. Uh, and you can tell that they're not prepared. They're not prepared to answer the questions du jour uh, from the press corps, or they're not prepared to uh, take a tough question uh, from Wolf Blitzer or, or whoever else. Uh, and I don't know that I have a silver bullet uh, for um, overcoming that, but it, you just have to be on your toes uh, at all times. Uh, and it really stings uh, when, when that happens, uh, undoubtedly. Um, I don't know if of an occasion where I was bloodied up too much. You know, I like to say that I got dinged up a, a little bit, like every government spokesperson does, but I wasn't T-boned. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> yet. <laughs> I should probably caveat that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's a very good point, uh, and it's one of the risks of going to the podium. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very interesting uh, discussion so far. Uh, I hope your colleagues agree. Thank you. Consulting here in the uh, Beltway area. Of Great. Um, my question kind of goes back to the cyber vein. I'm really interested if I get your comments on the current, what seems like possibly an evolution. Uh, the ISIS um, hacking uh, network, I guess they're calling it now, or what the exact name I, escapes me, but do you feel that's an evolution, you know, releasing uh, the whereabouts and the names of the folks that were involved? In, uh, it's obviously uh, deeply disturbing, uh, to, to say the least, and, um, you know, ISIS apparently and regrettably has at least some degree of sophistication with social media because they are able to have impact, right, in, in various ways, and we've all seen that. Uh, carried out in very, uh, in a very unfortunate manner. I'm very worried about this uh, latest uh, threat, apparent threat. Uh, don't have much more information on it than that. I'm out of government now, but uh, if I were the Pentagon press secretary, I would be very, very concerned. These uh, terrorist groups have grown in sophistication over time. It's not just ISIS uh, that's been somewhat effective, again, regrettably, uh, at using social media. Uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, with its Inspire magazine has, uh, I think, had some effect as well and, and through other social media uh, channels. So terrorists are uh, using this to some effect uh, and are probably attracting some recruits uh, as a result. Um, I think this is something we just have to contend with. Uh, it's a hard problem. Uh, radicalization uh, occurs in, in different ways. Some of it may be through social media or inspired through messages that the people see. I'm not sure it's the channel itself uh, that, that is the, the issue, but it's maybe the volume and, and so forth and information flowing through. Uh, I don't have, again, a, the answer, but it's uh, something that we need to, to contend with. And that's really getting voices out there to, to counter some of these messages. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding Hunter Pleasant, the image of the West in the Arab world. 
Since we've seen since the end I'm, I'm of sorry, could you repeat the, the top? Uh, I, uh, okay, uh, since the end of World War One. Yes. We have witnessed a difficult relationship with the Arab world, especially North Africa and the Middle East, um, which felt that they've been victimized by mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. has been furthered by 9-11, and whereas many high-level officials have been uh, announcing that fundamental Islam, uh, radical Islamist is the greatest threat to the United States and the Western world. Um, so, and thereby we have a very negative perception among the public in the North, in North Africa and the Middle East. How do we improve our communication strategy with those countries in order to mm -hmm. change those perceptions while we're still engaging actively militarily in that region? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question, uh, one that we've been contending with uh, for, for a very long time. And again, I wish I had all the answers, but I, I don't. But clearly, um, there are some uh, in Middle East North Africa who, who think that we are not acting in the right ways. Uh, but the reality, of course, is that when it comes to terrorism in particular, we are going after a very small minority uh, of, of uh, a radicalized extremist uh, population. Uh, I know that's not um, something that everyone believes uh, in this part of the world, but it, it, is the, it is the reality. And I think it's going to just take some time uh, matching words with deeds, matching our commitment uh, to democratization uh, in that part of the world with, uh, with, with the kind of uh, uh, follow-up that uh, people seem to want to, to demand. But it's going to take a while, uh, I think, to overcome some of these issues. They've been around for a long time and they will, they will continue to be. But if we pull back, that's what will cost us the most. Uh, we have to continue to engage uh, and communicate, and it's not all communication through people like me and the media, it's communication at the diplomatic, intelligence, and military levels, um, because I think that's, that's critical. What I do worry about is that uh, some of these issues are, are causing uh, a bit of a tendency to disengage uh, in the conversation on, in this country, and I think that would be to our detriment uh, long term. Yes, sir. You referred to my earlier occupation about the USIA. Yeah. And you know it was abolished as an agency in 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't claim to be indifferent to that, but do you think that hurt? Or is back in the programs are back at the State Department now? Mm -hmm. It came from there in the first place. Right. Has, has that made a difference, uh, better or worse? Well, I think public diplomacy is very important. Uh, we didn't call it that then, but I did it. Yeah, you did it, right, exactly. And uh, uh, I, I think, frankly, I, I disagree uh, with the abolition of USA. I think it was a, an important tool of, of foreign yeah. policy, uh, and I wish it were still around. It could probably be helpful uh, in this day and age.